Welcome to this week's weekly webinar series. My name is Molly Keck and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. This week we're going to be talking butterfly gardening. So some of the just basic butterfly garden basics that you want to know are you want to make sure that you choose both nectar and host plants so that you bring your butterflies in for two reasons. Um, you need to be prepared that if you are planting host plants that they are going to be eaten by caterpillars and you have to be prepared that you might have to cull some of those caterpillars. Otherwise, they'll start to cannibalize each other or they'll eat all of the food and then there's no more food left. You also want to try to cluster your plants. Butterflies are attracted to clusters and clumps of plants as opposed to rows or lines of plants. And make sure that you have a varying bloom period. You, you want your, your butterflies to have food all year round, not just in the spring or in the, in the fall time. You also want to make sure that you provide some sort of a windbreak for your plants. Make sure that they're always in a ton of sunlight, but be able to allow some sort of a windbreak, whether that be a house, a structure, a fence, so that you don't have huge gusts of wind coming in. Butterflies are pretty dainty insects, and so if there's a lot of wind, they're not going to be able to stand and rest and be attracted to those plants. They might love those plants in every other situation, but if there's too much wind, they're never going to visit them. So the other thing that you have to consider is what are you trying to do? Are you trying to provide a host plant for your butterflies to come in, lay their eggs, and then be able to watch the life cycle occur? Or are you just providing nectar plants so that your butterflies have a nectar source for just the adults? Or are you trying to do both? During this gardening series, we are going to just talk about those host plants that the mothers are attracted to so they can lay their eggs. And that brings butterflies in, but it also allows you to see the complete life cycle. Remember, a life cycle of a butterfly is in four parts. A mother, an adult, lays eggs on a host plant that they know that their babies like to feed on. The caterpillars hatch out of the egg form and start to feed on the leaf material. Um, caterpillars feed on the plant material. Once they've fed and they've, they've molted several times, they're big and fat, they will leave the host and they will pupate. When they emerge from the pupa, they're an adult and the cycle starts all over again. Adults don't feed on plant material, they feed on nectar. They have, they have um, siphoning mouth parts, whereas the caterpillars have chewing mouth parts. And caterpillars are really interesting. They have a number of different defense mechanisms, such as camouflage. They might look like uh, bird droppings. You're definitely not gonna touch that because you don't wanna touch bird droppings. They might have urticating hairs. Um, insect, many of the, the caterpillars that you might come across will have hairy bodies. And I always recommend that you don't touch anything that has a lot of hairs on it if it's an insect, because it usually means that it's meant that way to scare off predators. While this guy does not have um, stinging hairs on its body, it's not a stinging caterpillar. What it does do is if you happen to be a lizard or a bird and you eat it, you consume the caterpillar, you might get those urticating hairs in your digestive tract and you'll remember next time, I'm not gonna eat anything that looks like that. You never know if it could sting you and hurt you and you also never know if those might break off onto your skin if you rub your nose or rub your eyes um, or other sensitive skin areas of your body. Um, then it can be very, very annoying and irritating until those hairs finally work their way out, much like prickly pear cactus. They might also have some really cool mimicry looking like a larger animal so that you scare off a predator like this spice, spice bush caterpillar. This one certainly and definitely looks like a snake, but it isn't. It's actually a caterpillar. But if that reared back and looked at you, you'd probably back off a little bit if you were a lizard or a bird trying to feed on that. They may also have something called aposomatic coloration. Um, this is uh, where they're brightly colored or uniquely colored or patterned, so it, it leaves a memory um, in a predator. If, In the case of this milkweed caterpillar, if a predator comes along and feeds on it, it will get an upset stomach, it will taste terrible, it will spit it out, and that predator will remember, I don't want to eat anything that looks similar to that. Some of them also have a little osmotarium. They might scare you a little bit. When you mess with many of the, the swallowtail caterpillars, they will shoot out these little osmotarium to startle you. And again, if you were a predator, you would step away from it. The larvae have a lot of really neat defense mechanisms to allow them to survive. Because if you think about it, many of them are pretty conspicuous. 
They're also very soft bodied. So you can imagine they'd probably be a very good, easy meal for a bird or a lizard. After they've been a caterpillar, they will spin a pupa and, 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 um, or a cocoon um, and enter the pupal phase. And there's many different varieties and looks to, caterpill, to pupa of uh, butterflies and moths, which make them very unique as well. It's often very difficult to determine exactly who is inside that pupa case. So if you find the pupa and you're curious as to what it is, just put it in a jar and give it a little bit of time and likely you'll determine very quickly exactly what, what's going to come out. Butterflies are in the order Lepidoptera, and so these are butterflies, moths, and skippers. And everything that is in this order Lepidoptera has scales on their wings, and that's what lets you know that you've got a butterfly, a moth, or a skipper that's related to one another. When you touch those things, you get that soot on your hand, and that's the scales that give them the coloring that butterflies, moths, and skippers have. That also allows us to collect them and make really pretty collections of them like I have back behind me. Because the scales maintain the color, the color is not in the pigment of their body. When we die, we also will lose our color, our rosy cheeks, and, and we will turn gray and ashen, right? Well, many insects do the exact same thing, but, but lepidopterans will retain their coloring because the color is in the scales. So I mentioned that the caterpillars have chewing mouth parts and they feed on plants. Well, the adults, again, have siphoning mouth parts, and so they are entering and going in to feed on nectar. All they feed on is liquid food in the form of nectar. And so we have to provide flowering plants that have nectar um, to be able to support the adult form of a, of a butterfly moth or a skipper. The main difference between a butterfly moth and skipper is um, to look at the antenna. A butterfly has kind of a long antenna with a little knob or a ball at the end of it. Moths have very fluffy or um, um, plumose antenna is what they're called. And skippers have are kind of a, an in-between between a moth and a butterfly. Butterflies have very tiny bodies, moths have very robust bodies, a skipper is somewhere in the middle. And then they also have a, um, their antenna have a really nice little kink at the very end of it. Um, they're called skippers because when they fly, they kind of skip around. But in this presentation, we're really just gonna be covering host plants for specifically butterflies. Another way you can tell the difference is by looking at the way their wings are when they're at rest. For the most part, butterflies fold their wings up at rest, skippers are somewhere in between, up and down, and moths lay them kind of flat. So just to kind of give you a um, recap or a refresher for biology, we're going to be looking at specific families of butterflies and what things are, what uh, host plants they're attracted to. So if you break things down, insects are in kingdom animalia, that's the most inclusive. Then they're in phylum Arthropoda. Uh, they break off from us from there because we're in phylum Chordata. They're in class Insecta along with all other insects. Lepidoptera is just your butterflies, moths, and skippers. And now we're going to look more at family, which begins to get more and more specific. And because it's more and more specific, it's just above genus and species, um, you're able, many things within one family might have the same host plant. So we can be a little bit more broad. Swallow, so swallowtails are um, a very unique and very colorful and pretty and very, very common um, group of family of, of uh, butterflies. They're the in the family Papillonidae. Um, they're off, often called papillonids. They're all swallowtails because you can see that little um, kind of teardrop that comes off of the back wing right there. And there's a number of different species that are out there. They're very host specific though. So this is a very unique group after I said we could be very broad about things. The papillonids, you have to be, they're pretty host specific. So a pipe vine swallowtail isn't gonna eat what the tiger swallowtail wants. And so that's kind of unique in that you can bring in specific butterflies if you have their host plants in the area. The um, giant swallowtail prefers citrus. They lay their eggs on citrus plants and they have a, they're the ones that have a very unique larva that looks like bird droppings so that you don't notice that they're even on your citrus plant um, or you're a predator and you're not going to go anywhere near that. But they're a very large, pretty colored um, butterfly on the top side of the wings. They're mainly black with the with the yellow, but on the underside, they're mainly yellow with black. So it's, almost, it's pretty much reversed. Um, and they're just very pretty and very unique. 
the adults feed on whatever nectar plant they want to, but they lay their eggs on citrus. So if you want these guys, plant. The eastern tiger swallowtail is one of my personal favorites. It's as large, if not sometimes larger than the giant swallowtail, or at least it appears to be when it's flying. And I like it just because it looks like a tiger. There's just the coloring is very unique. Um, the, uh, the, the yellow is very striking as they're flying, and you certainly notice them as they're flying through the air. Um, and you will notice that the types of plants that they lay their eggs on are a lot of native um, uh, trees. So you can plant these certainly in your yard, but if you're seeing these around, you're finding them because they're uh, laying their eggs on things like this. So um, red bay, sassafras, um, things in the olive family like red ash, laurel families, um, willow family. So they prefer to lay their eggs on trees, larger things, and you're not really going to readily come across the adults most likely unless you have one of these trees and they're relatively small in your landscape. And you can see the, the larvae are pretty interesting looking. But if you see the adults flying around, you know you've got probably one of those trees in that family very close by. Black swallowtails have a, a couple different species, and it's really hard to differentiate between the two species. But um, black swallowtails tend to like things in the rue family. So they love fennel and dill and parsley and rue. And they will take on the smell of what they're feeding on also. So when you mess with them and that osmotarium comes out, uh, they smell like the fennel or the rue or the, the parsley. So if you plant, if you're planting these herbs outside, make sure that you, if and you want to bring these larvae in um, or the adults in to lay the eggs, make sure that you plant plenty of this food source because they will very quickly eat it completely down to nothing. And then again, they'll start to cannibalize each other if you have too many on a plant. But they're very, very interesting, very pretty, very velvety and soft when you try to touch them. Um, very interesting uh, butterflies. There's also a number of kind of native um, things, in, they, they kind of native plants that are in the rue family, and you might just accidentally see some of these guys crawling around on some of those out in a native landscape. But generally, they like these herbs that we plant uh, for ourselves. The pipe vine swallowtail is probably the most common swallowtail that you come across at least in the San Antonio area. And I think it's because there are some pipe vines, um, the Aristolochia, that are native and may not necessarily resemble the pipe vine that we plant as an ornamental type plant. But it, I noticed that when I'm mowing my yard um, and I've kind of cut the grass and I've cut down probably some of that native life, that native plant life, these guys will start just kind of moving around. They're pretty cosmopolitan and pretty much found anywhere. And they're a very unique, um, very dark red maroon colored with, with yellow little knobs all over the body. They look scary and frightening, but they're completely harmless. Um, and you'll see them crawling just across your lawn or across the street, trying to look for a new host or maybe to, to leave the host to go find a place to pupate. But super duper common. The adults are usually found on prairie verbena or tons of wildflowers um, and native flowers that you might have in your landscape. Parody is a family of um, all of the sulfurs, the whites, sulfurs, orange tips, just some um, very, very common um, inconspicuous butterflies that you probably will see flying around. Um, the uh, sulfurs are not a great thing because they um, can eat on alfalfa. And so if you're a grower of alfalfa, you're not really a, a favorite of these guys, or they're not a favorite of you. But there are a number of different um, sulfurs, orange tips, dog faces, um, very common in the Texas landscape. If you've got some flowering plants, they're attracted to it both as adults. But the things that they like to lay their eggs on in general are mustards, sennas, partridge peas. So the cloudless sulfur um, is the one that feeds on alfalfa, and they have a very different looking larva that is yellow also. Since they're a smaller butterfly, they're a relatively small caterpillar, but their favorite things are the things in the senna group. Um, they like pea families, cassia species, so desert senna and flowering senna, which are certainly things that you can plant. The Mexican yellow, or often called a wolf face, from the underside, they are completely yellow, but when they open their wings, they look nothing like 
you would think that they do from the underside. I don't have any idea why they're called a wolf face. I just know that that's what some people do call them. Um, and they have kind of a um, very camouflaged caterpillar there. Um, they like things in the legume family, acacia and defisa. So black locust, cat claw, acacia, things like that. So, you know, we have a lot of native acacias. These guys are just a very common native butterfly. The lyc lycinidae family um, is made up of all the hair streaks and the metal marks and the blues. And these are really dainty, um, pretty little tiny butterflies. If you look at that gray hair streak, they certainly have a really neat look to them, how they have the patterns on the antenna with the tips being really orange. They're so small that you don't often appreciate the pretty coloring that they have. And they are very, very blue, which is not, at least in butterflies, is not really a common color. Most are, you know, blacks and yellows and whites and um, blue is just not really a color that you see on, on many insects. And so these guys definitely have that. They uh, um, prefer to feed on things like legumes, flowers, oaks, and um, just in general, other trees. And they have really, really cute little caterpillars that are very short and stubby. Um, this almost looks like an asp, at least in its shape, it looks like an asp, but it is certainly not an asp. So Lacey's scrub hair streak is one hair streak because as a little tiny, it's not really a drop like a swallowtail has, it's just a little hair that kind of flips up. Um, they like things in the Spurge family, Bernardia, Oak family, Walnut family, Knotweed family. So wild buckwheat and oaks and pecans, things that we already have well established all throughout our landscapes in San Antonio um, and in Texas. And then, and then, of course, Bernardia. Serranus blue is a really pretty, very blue colored um, uh, blue butterfly. It loves things in the legume family. So, uh, and you can see it also has a, the, the caterpillar is really similar to that lacy scrub hair streak right there. Um, it likes fern acacia, honey mesquite, Texas out, Texas ebony. So things that are native, which is why these are a really common um, butterfly that we have here. Reichert's blue um, is a Another one that has a really similar looking caterpillar you can see in that picture there. And again, they like things in the legume family. So again, honey mesquite, indigo bush, yellow sweet clover, cat claw acacia, white clover. Those are all things that they will want to lay their eggs on. And you might see those caterpillars feeding. The nymphalidae uh, family is one that you are probably very, very familiar with. And and just from looking at these pictures here, you can see that they all look very different, even though they're in the same family. Um, and they are a very unique. Uh, all of them have very pretty colors to them. Some of them in the nymphalid or the brush footed butterfly group can be kind of bland, maybe, and um, not very colorful. But then just like you see from these, they're very brightly colored and very, very interesting. This is a very, very large group. You could kind of compare it to when you look at insects, beetles, there's so many different types of beetles. Well, in the nymphalidae family, there's a lot of butterflies that are in here. My absolute favorite group of butterflies are the heliconians. Um, heliconians are uh, just kind of unique and, and long in shape. To me, the zebra on the left-hand side is just incredibly beautiful. The coloration is very striking. It also just, it just looks like it's very tropical and shouldn't belong here. Um, the zebra heliconian is on the left. On the right is a Julian heliconian. Um, and you can see that their caterpillars are really, really interesting looking. They tend to, they like passion flowers and things in the passion flower group. And you've probably seen passion flowers before or, or passion things in the passion flower family. And you know that they're very tropical looking, very interesting looking flowers, just like the one on the bottom uh, left hand side. The Gulf Fritillary and the Variated Fritillary are, bro are both in this same group that like passion flowers and things in that same family. Um, and so you can find them on, on these plants. Put these guys out, put those flowers out, and you'll have them coming for both the nectar and to lay their eggs on. And I just think the caterpillars of these are just very interesting looking. If you have done any research um, or looked up how to raise butterflies, you know that painted ladies are probably the most common ones that you can get your hands on. And one of the reasons for that is because they have a 
huge list of plants that they will utilize as a host. And so as a result, they're very easy to raise and they're found everywhere all over the United States. And so they're, you're not really going to introduce something that doesn't belong um, somewhere. But painted ladies, very common cosmopolitan uh, butterfly, also a nymphalid in the brush footed butterfly group. They um, the sun, they're in the sunflower family or they like things in the sunflower family, legumes, mints, mallows, plantains, buckthorns, nettles, and verbena. So a huge long host range. Um, so again, some of the ideas that you've got here, there's yarrow, white clover, red sage, common mallow, Texas lantana, white sage, musk thistle, just a huge range of, of hosts that these guys can um, utilize. Common buckeye is another nymphalid. Remember, this is a very, very large group. And these guys prefer things in the acanthus, stone crop, figwort, and verbena family. So Drummond's wild petunia, yellow stone crop, snapdragon vines, Texas paintbrush is another one, um, common wild petunia, Texas verbena, foxglove. I mean, the, the list really can go on for these common buckeyes. And that's probably why they get the name common, because they're found commonly on a lot of things. Many of the patches, um, or all of the patches, are also in the nymphalid family. So these guys prefer things in the sunflower family. And I will get calls about these all the time when someone's grown sunflowers in their garden, or they have a sunflower patch, and it's very close to a, um, their garden or their veggie garden. And they will find these very, very weird patches leaving the sunflowers and then they tr are trying to pupate somewhere else and they'll find them on their vegetables and they get concerned about it. But if you just do a little bit of research about what is around you, what other plants are around you, oftentimes you can Google caterpillar on and then say whatever the host is and you can come up pretty easily with what specific butterfly or moth it could, it could be. But things that are in that same sub, sub, sunflower family other than our typical sunflowers, Indian blanket, Calpin daisies, copper, ragweed, um, zeminia is another one. And this is um, something you can often find at the nurseries. It's also a really great nectar producing plant. Crescents are also in the nymphalid group. And these guys like things in the acanthus family. So hairy, hairy tube tongue, the Carolina wild petunia, false mint. Um, those are all things that they will utilize as a host plant. <coughs> pearl crescents also like things in the sunflower family but more specifically they also they like asters so white aster tall willow aster texas aster um, those they will utilize as a host plant be careful with this because um, a lot of people plant asters as part of just their regular landscape not necessarily to bring in these pearl crescents or to have them lay their eggs on it so very quickly they can take over um, your asters if you put them out, so you have to kind of keep an eye on it. Question marks are one of a really neat looking butterfly. I think it's kind of orange in color. It very much blends in with everything, but when they close their wings, they have what looks like to be a question mark. Um, and I just think that it's just kind of neat, the shape of the wings that they do have. But these guys love things in the elm family and the nettle family. And if you look, that looks like a really ferocious looking caterpillar. To my knowledge, it is not a it is not a stinging caterpillar, but it sure looks like it wants to be a stinging caterpillar. So they like American elms and sugar berries and nettles. Um, of course, this is not something you would plant in your landscape to bring in question marks and to see the life cycle because nettles can be there can be stinging nettles, um, but they utilize those plants out in the in the wild as a larva. And I think everybody's favorite group of butterflies is certainly um, the day to day family. And these are our monarchs and our queens. These guys love milkweed and utilize milkweed as part of their life cycle and laying their, their larvae on. Um, the monarch and the queen caterpillars are very striking. They have that aposomatic coloration. And these are the ones that love to chomp on milkweed. Um, the monarch, you know, being the king of, of all butterflies is kind of a, a Texas staple. It is our Texas state insect. Um, and it's just a really pretty interesting and, and very large butterfly as well. So monarchs and viceroys are 
two uh, butterflies that are in two different families. Danidae is what the group is for monarchs, and then Emphalids is for the viceroy. So they're in two totally different families. Um, the viceroy is actually a brush-footed butterfly, but they exhibit um, Batesian mimicry, we believe. There's some controversy that maybe it's not necessarily this type of mimicry, but basically the viceroy is edible. And again, some people are saying viceroy really isn't it edible. And they're mimicking the inedible monarch because monarchs feed on the, the things in the Danidae group feed on milkweed. The milkweed is toxic and it makes the caterpillar toxic. And so um, things that eat it spit it out. Well, if you if you're toxic as a caterpillar, they're still toxic as a butterfly. And this viceroy adult is mimicking the monarch so that nothing feeds on it. The big difference between the two, other than, in my opinion, viceroys tend to be smaller and monarchs are larger. The biggest and easiest way to identify the difference between the two is to look at that line on that hind wing. The viceroy has a thick um, black line that crosses over the veins, additional line that the monarch does not. Um, and then you can also look at some of the other spotting and just kind of um, the fact that the the viceroy's dotting along the margin is larger, but the vein is really the easiest and quickest way to identify the difference between the two. So they love milkweeds. I'm not going to get into um, the controversies um, and the politics about do you use tropical milkweed or native milkweed, but there is a number of native milkweeds that you can utilize. Some research has shown that using non-native milkweed promotes a fungal growth a fungus inside of the monarchs that can be detrimental to them. So if you can get your hands on some of the native species, I believe there's about 12 or so native species, then that's probably health-wise safer for these guys. Um, but there, if you allow weeds to be weeds, these are certainly weeds, then you can have some of your monarchs coming in, both feeding and laying their eggs on it. The butterfly weed is probably, um, the tubularis I think is the, is the genus, is probably the one that most people prefer to plant in their landscape. Um, it can get kind of leggy. It can look kind of like a weed as well, but the nurseries have been working on trying to um, breed them and, and um, only breed certain plants that allow for a more compact look, which is what most people like. And so you can actually find a lot more milkweed in the nurseries today than you were even able to three, four, five years ago. Um, it used to be very, very hard to find milkweed for your monarchs. And we want to plant those milkweeds. We certainly do. We know that monarchs are declining, that their migration is, is changing, that we're seeing less and less of them as they come through. And one of the biggest reasons for that is habitat destruction. We have less native areas where we allow those native weeds to bloom and grow. Um, a, a farmland. Farmers don't want those weeds inside of their um, inside their, their row crops, right? So there's just habitat destruction, um, so there's no place for them to lay their eggs. Monarchs are very unique in that they migrate. They're one of the few insects that do a true migration. And what we see in this time of year during the spring, if you're finding monarchs outside, um, you're seeing the migration of the, the monarchs coming up from Mexico. And what's mind-blowing is that that monarch will follow the same path that its mother took but its mother never told it which path to take. They just happen to know what to do. So they're going to travel up in the spring and then eventually get to the summertime and spend it up in the northern um, states where it's cooler. In the uh, fall, they'll start to migrate back down and make it to Mexico where they will overwinter. They'll die off, lay eggs, babies hatch, and it's those babies that are coming through in the springtime. So without any memory, they still follow the same path that their parents took, which is crazy. And we definitely certainly have... Um, pockets of native populations. Not every single monarch you see migrates, um, but we want way stations along the way to allow them to lay more eggs, reproduce, find food, so they can make it down to Mexico and back up and continue that migration pattern. Because obviously, it's very important to them. It's essential to their the livelihood of that and the existence of that species. We don't understand why, but it certainly does. Um, and so, uh, I think it's important to help. Um, preserve a really beautiful species of a uh, butterfly. 
So just to kind of give you a recap of, you know, if you if you just want one idea of what you wanted to plant outside, the things that give you the most bang for your buck as far as getting butterflies to come in and lay their eggs so you can see those caterpillars develop, milkweeds, dill, fennel, and parsley. Remember, milkweeds are going to get you um, specifically the, the monarchs and the queens. Dill, fennel, and parsley get you the uh, swallowtails. Common sunflower gets you a number of different things, including a lot of the crescents, right? Um, and the um, the pearled crescent and the maybe even some of the hair streaks. Globe mallow. Passion flower is going to get you heliconians and fritillaries. And then escarpment black cherry is another one that will get you a lot of those more native um, brush-footed butterflies. So if you want more bang for your buck, those are the those are the six or so that are good options for you so you can see the life cycle continue. Thank you for joining us for this week's weekly webinar series. We hope that you enjoyed it. My name is Molly Keck and I am an entomologist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bear County. We hope that you join us and watch more of our webinars on our YouTube channel, My Extension 210. Be sure to check it out there and all of the other webinars that we have.